Today's guest is David Woods Bartley. David has seen his fair share of successes and setbacks, from directing a nationally recognized nonprofit to battling a life-threatening mental illness. The latter, a brutal knockdown, drag-out flight with clinical depression, led David to a suicide attempt. David continues the important yet still challenging journey from the isolation of mental illness to the inclusive space of mental wellness, thanks to the support of many great people and being shown the necessity of putting one's self-care on a pedestal. David is committed to moving the conversation about mental illness and suicide from the dark shadows where they now live to the forefront of public concern. In doing so, his mission is to shine a bright light on the crisis we now face and open doors to the possibility of mental health for everyone, everywhere. David Woods Bartley, welcome to Next Steps Forward. Chris, thank you so much, and, and what an honor and delight to be here. Thank you, brother. No, honor is ours. Thanks for your time today. Mental illness to mental wellness. That paints quite a vivid picture. Mm -hmm. I know you come from a military family. Take a few minutes to describe your life growing up, please. So it, my uh, family of origin was uh, four boys. Um, and then dad died when I was very young, just seven years old. And my eldest brother, John, really became 11 years older than I, became really my brother. And he's one of those rare Mustangs. So he enlisted in the Army in, way back in 1970 as an E1 and then made his way to prep school and then ultimately to West Point and then worked all his way, worked all the way up to be a major general. And I mentioned all that because he, I lived on post with him, followed his career, and he really became an essential part and continues to be a huge influence on my life. My middle two brothers kind of, because they were 13 and 15 at the time, they did their own thing. So mom remarried four years later and my stepdad, believe it or not, Chris had nine children so I grew up kind of like, I guess, a platoon size uh, <laughs> group of 13 children. I was number 12 of 13 and then just kind of moved on through my life and ultimately grew up in Maryland and then headed out here where I live now in Northern California 33 years ago. How do you transport 13 kids? Do you have like a school bus or a couple of minivans? I mean, oh, wow. Was, you know what? And I tell you what, it really was military precision in the fact that um, one, in terms of the mental health paradigm, and my parents were super forward thinking when they got married not long after, and we had this, again, this platoon, it, we got right into family counseling, which is really forward thinking of them, like, wow, try to, to be ahead of some problems that we would have. And then what they did is they divided the kids into teams. And every night a team of kids had dinner. You learned how to do your own laundry. You cleaned your room that you shared with somebody and you had a section of the house to clean. So it was really orderly. I will say that there was a little bit of a void from an emotional standpoint. And as I'm sure that we'll talk about later, being one of those highly sensitive kids who ultimately suffered from clinical depression, that was a little tough. Um, and so that emotional availability and the space for people to express their feelings, and we're all entitled to those feelings. I think, and I might be jumping towards the end, that's a really important piece as a foundation for mental health. How'd you find yourself, of all things, leading a nonprofit animal sanctuary? <laughs> it was like, it wasn't planned. Like I didn't grow up and say, oh my gosh, I wanna be a veterinarian. So my former wife, who's still a very, very dear friend, I met Dee back in 1996 and she had, and you can see over my shoulder, um, a Boston Terrier. And Bostons are those little smaller versions of an English bulldog, and they're filled with enthusiasm and a tremendous amount of gas. Um, I have a 11, 11 month old Boston on my lap right now, believe it or not. So I had never had a dog before. I was 33 years old and fell in love. Ours was a story of a boy meets girl who has a dog. And then we had Wally for four years, and then Wally passed away on October 10th of the year 2000. We then, in honor of Wally, we adopted a 13 and a 12-year-old Boston Terrier that were sick and old and had been just thrown away. And that started this whole unplanned, unthought about, unimagined path to then moving and getting some property and looking to bring in animals that were sick or old who had some sort of special need or the vast majority were at the end of life. So we were a forever home. We did no adoptions. And at one point, Chris, we had 100 animals at any one time, 25 horses, 23 dogs, nine pot belly pigs, like goats, sheep, ducks, geese, bunnies, birds, turtles, fish. And it was amazing. It was, and the, you know, at one point as we're getting bigger on this path that 
you know, quite frankly, I think God had spread out before us that we needed a name. And the first two dogs that we rescued after Wally died were Chance and Bliss. So now fast forward a couple of years, like, wow, I guess this is what we're going to do. And we need a name. And a dear friend of mine said, well, why don't you call the sanctuary a chance for bliss? And I'm like, boom, <laughs> like mic drop, that's it. So it's an amazing experience. I, I you know, it, yeah. And what I do now <clears throat> in effort to honor my former wife and honor all these animals and the people, what I do is I take mental illness and I wrap it in animal stories. So I have probably 30 different stories that are not told, Chris, just for a cuteness factor, each and every story, and if we have time today, I'll share a couple that has a very specific teaching point. It, it is meant to put, to give people a safe proximity to this very difficult topic of mental illness and suicide, where they might be able to relate, where they can imagine what they can do to help somebody based on the story of the animal. And so it, you know, and I never thought I'd be doing this. It was a wonderful surprise. Obviously I'm obsessed because there's pictures of dogs everywhere in my house. Were you building Noah's Ark with all these animals on your- No, I thank you. I, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes what I like to say is I, you know, I say Noah's jealous, you know? <laughs> he had a big boat and was on water. We were just on this, this beautiful section of land, a little town. It was like a hamlet, it's called Penrim. And it's about 30 minutes east of Sacramento in Northern California, but yeah, it was. And I'll tell you, all the dogs, as many as 23 lived in the house, believe it or not. So you think like dog house, look in the dictionary, there I am. But it was super clean. There's, you know, I have a little OCD. It worked well for me at that point. So you were building this sanctuary while you were grappling with your mental illness. Mm. Do you know the roots and the origin of your depression? Was it hereditary, caused by trauma? I, I, I do. And actually it was that unfortunate yet too common confluence of those two things. So my father's father, my paternal grandfather, uh, he ended his life by suicide when my father was very young. And while my father ended his, I'm sorry, when my father passed away when I was very young, what, and I don't have a lot of memories of him, Chris, but what my three older brothers, John, Jim, and Tom had shared with me that he was overwhelmed and incapacitated by horrific clinical depression. And now, Chris, knowing what a fight it is, like every day, my father died of cancer, but I know that his, his want to live had been diminished to the point where cancer could just scoop in. So I had this genetic predisposition, and it was interesting, on the second day in the psychiatric hospital, after my life had been saved from killing myself, I sat with a psychiatrist, and I hope everybody's had the experience where you've been in the presence of somebody that just makes it so safe, like this man, and he wasn't dressed in a lab coat, didn't have a stethoscope. And up to this point, I didn't know what the cause of it was. So we sat down and, and he asked, was there any history? And I shared what I just shared with you. But then he asked a question, Chris, that I had never been asked before. And to a certain degree, it's a counterintuitive question when he said, David, have you experienced any trauma in your life? And I don't know how many people, maybe more now, thankfully, but up to that point, no one had ever asked me that. And I said, no, doctor, I haven't. But then he said, well, you said you were young when your father died, how old were you? And I said, I was just seven. And he says, I am so sorry. That's a traumatic event for a little boy to lose his father. And then he said, and I don't know why he said this, but thankfully he did. He says, has there been anything else? And in fact, Chris, there was something else, something so horrific and awful that at 48 years old at the time, I had never shared with anybody. But again, there was something about the safe place that this man in the most unlikely of places had created. Before I could think, I said, doctor, when I was 11, I was brutally sodomized and raped by a Boy Scout leader. And then this extraordinary man, Chris, actually leaned forward and took my hands in his, just like a father would to a son, and looked at me and he said, David, this is not your choice. You didn't choose your genetics and you didn't choose your trauma. You didn't choose mental illness. But then he said four words, which really changed my life. He looked at me and he said, it's not your fault. And it was so contrary to what what I call the monster of clinical depression had convinced me 
that it was in fact my fault? Why didn't I fight back? Why didn't I try to run away? That I didn't say anything in response. It was almost like I couldn't hear him because this accumulated layer of shame was so thick that he picked up the nonverbal clues, held my hand just a little bit tighter in the most compassionate way. And he said, David, you got to hear me. It's not your fault. And the second time, just enough of a little crack. And I heard it. And every time I tell that story, I have that same visceral experience. Like there's goosebumps in my arm to say how four simple words can change a person's life. So those two things came together to create this, what has been now a 40 year experience of living with the monster, even today. You know, I've moved away, continue here 10 years later from the point that I was gonna end my life. And I still have days. I'd love to sit here in, in, in the presence and having the honor to be with you and say, I've never had another day of horrific depression and I've never had another day of killing myself, but that wouldn't be true. But thanks to the self-care that you referenced, they're days. They're not weeks, they're not months, they're not years. So they become manageable because I know in the morning, if I can just get through today, I know tomorrow is going to be different. You just referenced 10 years later. August 31st, 2011 was a watershed day in your life. What led you to the 730 foot high Forest Hill Bridge in Auburn, California that day? And what happened there? So I had just... Depression had gotten to the point where I was convinced that I was worthless and useless, that I was pitiful, grotesque, that I was weak, that I was nowhere close to being what a man should be, that I had no redeeming value, that I had become this embarrassment and a burden to my family. And the most damning thing, kind of a pivot on the expression that we know, the the straw that broke my mental and physiological, my psychological and spiritual back was on that day, Chris, albeit illogical, what I believed to be true was that if I would kill myself, everybody in my then life, including Deanna, including the sanctuary, they would all be better. And so, you know, we look at people and they end their life. And I, I can only understand, I can only imagine what the, the pain for a suicide loss survivor is. And we think, why are they being so selfish? And on that day, Chris, I honestly thought I was being selfless, that I literally would be giving a gift. And I'm not saying that it's logical. But what I, I share with people now is that suicide is not about facts. Suicide is not about reason. Suicide is not about logic. Suicide is about belief. And belief like faith is highly personal. When we're in, a, we're in a place of passionate belief or faith, people can give us all kinds of empirical data and science. It's not going to move us away from what we believe. And so it became, to a certain degree, almost a, it just was, it was clear to me that that's what I needed to do. And, and the other part that's really essential is the Forest Hill Bridge is 500 feet further off the ground than its more famous cousin in San Francisco. And this was not the first time I had traveled to the bridge, which underscores the truth that's, that suicide is almost never spontaneous. Chris, I had been plagued with suicidal ideations for close to 40 years. I had thought about killing myself thousands of times and I had driven to the bridge before. It, I almost did these practice runs. So that if, if in fact this day, and in this case, August 31st, 2011 came, I would know what to do. It, it wouldn't be like, I wouldn't be confused. In fact, I even knew where I was going to park. So I brought my vehicle to arrest, turned off the ignition, took the suicide note that I, that I had typed out, placed that at the center of the dash, keys out of the ignition, those in the center of the note, walked to the closest end of the bridge. And if you Google Forest Hill Bridge, the view is awe-inspiring. It's extraordinary. But on that day, it was like the the monster gave me a paper towel roll, and all I could see was the light post that was standing a thousand feet away right at the midpoint, at the highest arc on the bridge. And so I moved my way to the midpoint, turn to my left, don't look up, and then bend over, still looking through this paper towel roll of fixation down to the North Fork of the American River. Close my eyes again to imagine what's the most efficient way up and over the rail. And I'd done the math, Chris, it was going to take seven and a half seconds to fall. And the only uncertainty that I had at, 
in that entire day was, would I feel the impact? Would I feel the pain? I knew I was going to die. And so at that point, what I like to tell people is my thoughts were spinning at light speed to the extent where like that amusement park ride where it spins so fast and the floor drops out, but we still are held upright. Time was pushed out. So I don't know how long I was in this position, but thankfully it was long enough where someone made a 911 call and a heroic deputy sheriff came. And then there's a whole series of amazing things that he did that ultimately got me off that bridge and retraced my steps, began that journey from hellness to wellness. So someone actually saw you there and kind of guessed what you were doing and made the call. Yeah, and it was one of those situations, Chris, that we've all been in where, you know, we look upon a situation and we think, wow, that's off. Something's not right with this picture. And the first responder came, he approached me from the left-hand side. And as I share this, especially when I train military and police officers, because it's a, a different paradigm, the first thing he did was establish contact. And that's logistical. But then he created connection, which is life-saving because connection creates hope and hope saves lives. And what's interesting was he, I got off the bridge and then went to the emergency room and went to the psych ward. And then when people found out I was there, Chris, and why, to say they couldn't like process it would be an understatement because they didn't see me as clinically depressed, as mentally ill, as suicidal. People saw me as this one half of a committed couple who was running this large animal sanctuary. But one of the challenges as we endeavor to, to help souls like myself who are suffering is sometimes what hurts the most can't be seen. Sometimes great despair and soul crushing, hope killing agony lies just behind a forced smile, a distracting joke, or in this case, a seemingly perfect and ideal life. Like who wouldn't want to run an animal sanctuary? And, and not even Deanna knew. Like I could, I was a great actor and I could hide behind the velocity of our life like taking care of a hundred animals and I could deflect attention away from me. And so she had no idea there was, and there was nothing my family could have done to stop it. Not that they didn't love me or care or wouldn't be empathetic, but they didn't know. You say what hurts the most can't be seen. What does that mean? And what should we do with that knowledge? I, th I think what happens is, there's, there is, and it's almost an overused word at this point, but it's still important. There is such a stigma. Um, and if you look at the definition of stigma, it is roughly defined as a mark of disgrace. So we know probably um, Emily Bronte's great work, The Scarlet Letter. So I, I think most of us who have this condition, we feel like there's a, we're holding a sandwich board over us and it says mentally ill. And so that, that stops us from talking about it. And we live this life of unimaginable suffering. It is literally a living hell. There's a quote that says, depression must surely be the first cousin to hell on earth. And so I think if you look at what the symptoms or the signs of mental illness are, in particular clinical depression, they all, it can all be boiled down in a nutshell, Chris, to their slight and subtle changes in behavior. So the person who is very gregarious all becomes very isolated, very somber. The person who all of a sudden is very compliant becomes disruptive. Somebody may all of a sudden be giving away things that are priceless to them. Somebody may all of a sudden who's not very expressive says, gosh, I need you to know how much you mean to me. If something happens, please know how much I love you. And these signs are so easy to miss. And I underscore that because I don't feel people to feel guilty if somebody does end their life and they're like, gosh, how did I miss it? Because most of us are great actors. So I think one is in answer to the question, an awareness that most everybody in the, in paraphrasing the quote, most everybody is fighting a battle that we know nothing about. And then also to just be aware that person who was driving on the bridge and could have gone by and said, I just have this feeling something's not right. Let me call. Maybe it's nothing, but thank God they did. So I think we need to act. Did you ever get to meet that person who made the 911 call? I didn't. They didn't. And I don't remember the officer's name. And I actually like it that way. Um, it, it's, I don't, it allows me then when I stand in front of 
the members of the great thin blue line. And then my brother really, even as a general officer, where you think you have this, you know, stereotypical, non-emotional, emotionally distant, he's not that at all. And so it's, it's my way of honoring all of those. And then clinicians in behavioral health and psychiatrists and therapists. And it's really just to honor all of these people in, in a in really a global way. So I kind of like that I don't know who they are. Uh, I know who they are in my heart. What does it feel like to be depressed? You know, I, after 10 years of, of trying to explain it, I still don't feel like I do a good job, but I've come up with a new analogy. So we've all had a toothache before. And the thing about a toothache is, which is unique from, I think, any other kind of physical pain is, there's nothing you can do to escape it. Like, it's just, it's so pervasive. You know, other types of injuries, we can get busy and, and we kind of forget about the pain, but not a toothache. It is like completely systemic. So imagine you've had a toothache and imagine you had it for 20 years, like you lived with that every day. Now, add to that a time when you were completely heartbroken, end of a relationship, you had to put down a dog that you had had your whole life from growing up, you lost a parent, grandparent, a brother, a sister, maybe had the horror of losing a child. Imagine just the saddest you've ever been. And then imagine a time that you were disgusted with yourself, like, you totally blew it. You lied, you cheated, you stole, you let somebody down, you broke your word, you completely failed, you, you, and you had this feeling of self-hatred. And then add to that a time when you have been so incredibly tired, like just fatigued beyond belief where you cannot literally put one step in front of each other. So imagine all of those things, toothache, sadness, self-hatred and fatigue and then take a like a heavy winter coat and fashion all those things as the thread to that coat coat dip it in water and then wear it being completely heavy to the point where you can't stand it up then have somebody handcuff your arms behind you and then be put into a boxing ring and fight not just one boxer not just one mma fighter but be surrounded with them and try to defend yourself and do that every single day. That's what it feels like. And if you had a friend who's been the same way, what would you suggest that they do? For me, really, it is, Chris, it is this whole essence that connection creates hope and hope saves lives. And is on the days where I still feel like that person who was heavy laden, hands tied behind my back in the middle of a boxing ring. I know if I can just make one connection with one person in the most simple and ordinary way, it will help me maybe then uncuff my arms. And then as I go through my day and, and follow the aspects of my self-care plan, maybe I can just somehow make it to the gym and just get in that door and do something. Maybe I can go to Starbucks. I'm a big fan of chai tea, just some little aspect of self-compassion. Maybe I can send an email or maybe I can call my big brother and say, you know what, I, I just, I need to talk to you today. And I'm not saying that, that those things are easy. While they're simple things, they can, in the midst of being depressed, they can be like a Herculean action. But if you can do just one of those things, just one simple thing, that's what I would suggest. How has depression influenced who you are and shaped your personality? You know, it's interesting. I, I, the more I do this, and I've had probably north now of 300 counseling sessions, and, and part of that is just the severity of my condition. I'm on the more severe. I, I will take medication for the rest of my life, and I'm totally cool with it. It's I take two, one's the size of a Tic Tac, one's the size of an Altoid. And I say, you know what? Praise God that there are people who are fascinated by chemistry. And, and they, so when I look back now, Chris, I realize how long I have lived with this condition. Um, the, the horror of the trauma was a, became a repressed memory that didn't come up until I was a sophomore in college. And I look back now and see how, how difficult life was just to do ordinary things. And 
there's, you know, we, we know about fight, flight, or freeze in response to a tragedy. There's also, and I just learned this, there's actually the, what they call the fawn response. And what happens is, and when I learned this, I'm like, this is me, where somebody can respond as a victim to horrific trauma and feel like somehow they were complicit, somehow it was their fault. And they end up going through life being the first to apologize for things that are not even their fault. And I got to the point, Chris, in my worst moment where I literally, literally would apologize to people for the fact that I was alive. And it was that severe. So I think I struggle to this day with self-esteem. I struggle to this day with self-worth. I still have a problem with um, body dysmorphia. I look in, I look, there are days that I literally feel like I'm the most disfigured person in the world. When somebody tells me if I'm gonna go away on a trip, that they're gonna miss me, my mind literally cannot understand that. And I don't say that because I want someone to say, oh my gosh, you know, we love you and of course we're gonna miss you. It is like a foreign concept to me. Even after all this therapy, which has been incredibly helpful, I cannot logically accept the fact that if I'm not present, it would have it would make somebody sad. It like makes no sense to me. And so all of that has shaped who I am. And I still have a difficult time of identifying, not from a sexual preference, like, like I'm worthy. I'm, I'm a good man, you know, now engaged to a, an amazing woman following the, the sort of relationship that I have with my former wife. I um, have this kind of dual, not kind of a dual head of household. I'm a dad for the first time to three beautiful stepchildren. I'm like, can I do this? Am I worthy? Am, am I capable? So it's been really, really hard. It's still hard. It's, there are still days that it's just really difficult. You were especially moved by something that David Chang, a Michelin star chef, once said about his own struggle with bipolar disorder. He said, when you're depressed, you become convinced that everything you think is true. Was that your own experience? And how's it playing to someone's desire to kill themselves? Absolutely. And one of the things that I do in my talks is to, the, the base talk that I give most often, Chris, is called the why of suicide and the how of hope, which is really my story over these last 10 years. And, you know, why do people kill themselves? There's, there's all kinds of reasons. But I think as a foundation, what I do is I leverage Chef Chang's quote, because what happens is that you know, imagine if you think about it, we've all had bizarre thoughts. We've all had thoughts of, of self-hatred. We've all had just interesting thoughts. Most of the time we can push those to the side. But what if every single one of those thoughts you literally and I guess literally is the best word, you believe them to be true. So when people said that they would ask me, David, why would you want to kill yourself? then I would say, because what I believe to be true was the fact that I was ugly and pitiful and grotesque and useless. And then they say, well, David, gosh, didn't you realize how much you were going to hurt us? Why would you want to do that to us? And I said, because what I believe to be true was that your life would be better off without me. And so I think, Chris, to the answer of the question, that it really is these beliefs. That's why I think that suicide is not about fact and reason. It's about belief. And I became so overwhelmed up to that point and so convinced, like the monster convinced me that this was true as opposed to the reality of this truth. And I just, it became like... This is the clear thing to do. And, and I think what happens, Chris, is there are many, 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 many preponderance of people make the unfortunate decision to end their life based on a, a whole series of beliefs to, which I think is supported by, by, what, by what the great chef said. David, fascinating, very personal, in-depth first half of the show. And thank you for, for opening up to our listeners. I truly appreciate that understand the sensitivity, sensitivity of it. And sometimes it's difficult to, to relive that. So, so thank you. Can we circle back for a moment on what you think the impact of trauma is? Yeah. I mean, unfortunately, Chris, it's, it's widespread and it's almost, it, I have tried to, to come up with a way to explain it almost like, you know, your earlier question of what de does depression feel like? And so I ran across this quote literally two days ago, which I think is the best 
explanation of trauma that I've ever seen. And this is from a woman named Jane Levy. And here's what she says, Chris, is that trauma fractures comprehension as a pebble shatters a windshield. The wound at the site of impact spreads across the field of vision, obscuring reality and challenging belief. And it just, you know, we've all been driving around, along, have had that instance in which a pebble or a rock hits the windshield, starts as a crack, and then it completely spreads out and it blocks our view. And I, there's all, I, I mean, I think that that's just it, that there's two things to say is one, one of the reasons I think that, that we don't as individuals look to process and heal our trauma is we compare it to others. So maybe somebody has not had the experience that I had. Maybe it is they consider a lesser form of trauma, but trauma is trauma. All trauma is horrific. All trauma leaves a mark. All trauma will leave accumulated scar tissue. And so I think we need to honor the feelings that are associated with our trauma and then be able to, to share them. If you look at this this quote by Miss, Miss Levy in the last part about challenging belief. So we come into this world, I believe, believing that we are worthy, we are valued, we are worth the energy that somebody could give us, we are, we are worthy of love. But trauma then challenges that belief and creates these other beliefs that we, that we become convinced that they are true in tandem with what Chef Chang said. So trauma changes everything. And, and there are so many people, Chris, that are, are, have had and continue to have traumatic experiences, which it's impossible not for that aspect to, to shatter and to impact their field of vision and how they live life. And so I think one of the things in tandem with suicide prevention and awareness is to underscore that every person is worthy to recognize whatever trauma they have, to share that experience, and then be able to heal. Early in the show, you shared so many traumatic things that you went through in the first few decades of your life. Yet in the handful of conversations that you and I have had over the last month or so, you're always upbeat, optimistic, forward-looking, hopeful. What's your definition of hope? That's a great question. Um, you know, I looked it up in the dictionary. I'm always fascinated with, with words and especially the definition of words. And, and so there's two things. One, if you, if you look at all the different variations and all the different dictionaries, they're in a nutshell, which I'm, I kind of like to say is, is a former friend of mine says the net net is that hope is about the expectancy of something good. Like, I know something good is going to happen. And so with that, I, let me tell you about an amazing experiment that was done back in the 1950s. So a guy by the name of Kurt Richter, who was a Harvard researcher, wanted to try to measure, okay, what is or, or substantiate, what's the actual impact of hope? So what he did, it's a little bit of a brutal from the outside, if you're looking on the outside in this experiment. So what he did is he filled up a beaker of water and he took a rat and he put the rat in a beaker of water to see how long the rat could tread water before it would drown. And so on average, Chris, it was right about 15 minutes and right before the rat would drown, Chris, the, the researcher would take him out and put the rat and allow the rat to, to catch his breath, kind of calm down, maybe rest for a little bit of period. And then he put the rat back in the water. Now you'd think, okay, to be put back in the water, how long? would the rat be able to tread water then? So you think, okay, well, maybe 15 minutes, maybe less because he had exhausted himself. I don't know, maybe, could it be more? So it was interesting and he did this on repeated occasions. So it was, a, it was not 15 minutes, it wasn't 30 minutes, it was 60 hours, 60 hours. It went from 15 minutes and then having the experience that somebody would come to its aid, gave this rat an experience of hope, this expectancy that something good's gonna happen and they were able to tread water for 60 hours. When I first heard that, I said, there is no way that could be true. And sure enough, I Googled and I'm like, it's true. In fact, I'm holding the document right here, hope floats. 
um, it, it's amazing. So I, I, I really think, you know, we, we go to a wedding and, and I, we almost always hear this of, of faith, hope, and love. Love is the greatest. But you know what? I don't believe that. You know, in my own experience, you know, sometimes I feel like love is a little fickle. <laughs> it can kind of play hide and seek. A lot of times I don't feel worthy of love. Faith is like a rock star. I'm supposed to somehow in the midst of everything going wrong to know, okay, it's going to be right. And, and I still don't have that level of faith, even though it has, only has to be a mustard seed. But hope, hope demands nothing of us. It doesn't. Hope's not trying to play hide and seek. We don't need to do anything to be worthy of hope. Hope just wants to be invited, just allow us to be in it. It's, it allow us to be in its presence. So Charles Schultz, who created Peanuts, said that happiness is a warm puppy. I agree. Well, that means hope is a whole litter of eight-week-old Labrador puppies. <laughs> they just want to cover you. That's all. So I think, David, why did you want to kill yourself? And I say, because what I believed to be true was there was no hope. And if we don't have hope, there's no reason to live. And I think what happens is, Chris, my belief is people don't die from the medical condition of bipolar, schizophrenia, or depression. They die from hopelessness which is what those conditions create. It's what the monster wants to create. And that's why we pass away. You mentioned the rat there that was treading water. You know, when you have depression or suicide ideation, does that feel like you're treading water? Oh, yeah. There was somebody, there was a quote from a, a, a sufferer who said living with depression is like trying to breathe through a straw when you're covered in tar. And it just, it, it just, the enormity of the weight of it, it is such a thick, heavy feeling. And it is, it's like putting on not rose colored glasses, but glasses that are, it, it, I don't, I mean, all illnesses are bad. I just from my own experience on how it changes, like that there's no hope. It's just, it is so dense. It is so heavy. And, you know, I have a dear friend of mine who says depression has, is like amnesia. And I'm like, what are you talking about? He says, well, when we're depressed, we forget that we will in fact at one point feel better. But then when we feel better, we forget that there in all likelihoods is we're going to be at, at a point of being depressed again. And so you, you, you get in these moments and you think either everything is hopeless or everything is hopeful. And you have to be cognizant of the awareness by managing your well-being that most likely you're going to be in some sort of cycle. You've gone back to your military family roots mm -hmm. and you now do work with ROTC college students. Talk to us about the work you do there in terms of preparing them for mental wellness, mental health. So I, I you know, as, as mentioned, Chris, my, my brother, you know, to this day is, he's the greatest hero in my life. I mean, he just, he's, he, and you know, he, his style of command was, and you and I were talking about this, was creating a paradigm of inclusion. And, and people love serving for my brother. And my brother was the, continues to be the master of the handwritten note and always looking for ways that he could encourage people at the same time that there was a level of accountability and responsibility. And my brother always did the same thing on that two-star stationery. And he would always write the note. It was timely, specific, and authentic and send it to their house. And my brother is very humble. In fact, Chris, when he was promoted to general, it was during the war. And I said, oh my God, dude, you're going to get your first star. And I'm like, okay, tell me about the celebration. And he said, I'm not going to have one. What? What are you talking about? Like you started out as an E1 and now you're a general officer. And he said, no, I think it would be disrespectful. <laughs> okay. Only you could be that mindful about how other people might feel. And so you'd imagine this to this note would come and, and, you know, a, a handwritten note always comes in that uniquely sized envelope. And my brother just in the return address, Chris just wrote, would write J.R. Bartley, not general. And so whoever was going through the mail that day, I always imagine it was the same thing. Maybe they're surfing through the mail and they're like, this, well, the only J.R. Bartley I know would be Major General J.R. Bartley. And they'd open the note and it's like life changing. And the best response that my brother shared with me 
that he ever got was from an officer that was serving underneath him. And he said, sir, no amount of monetary award or other form of recognition compares in value to your handwritten note. And when I teach leadership classes, I'm like, this is all you need to do. Like, this is it. Like, it doesn't cost any money. So after I gave my first TED Talk, my big brother wrote me this note here. And when I teach ROTC and, and other military and, and police officers, I say, you know, I'm a touchy-feely guy. I tell stories about animals and everything else. You may think that this whole connection thing is whatever. You may just think, yeah, you know what, but you don't live in this paradigm. Like, you know the Army, you were kind of a military brat and following your brother, but you, you, know, you don't know what it's really like. I'm like, okay, all right, I can accept that. Well, let me tell you what my brother thinks about this. So here's what my brother wrote to me. He says, dear David, congratulations on your TED Talk. It was a very powerful and profound presentation. I have watched it a couple of times since then and learned more each time I watch it. It put into words what I've always known in my gut, but was never able to clearly articulate, and that is your belief that connection creates hope and hope saves lives. It reinforces my belief that it's all about the expenditure of energy. By doing something, you demonstrate that you care to people because it is just too easy to do nothing. You take your most valuable resource, time, use it up, and by doing so, show that you care. Because you can never get that time back nor create more, you have made a huge sacrifice and people react positively to that forfeit made on their behalf. In this age of technology, it is so easy to become isolated. Human connection that is needed by all is taken away and with that comes dehumanization and the problems associated that we are now seeing. Connection reverses that process. And so I tell to my military audiences and my law enforcement, I said, look, here's a war veteran that just, like, this is what will save lives. This is what will reverse that horrific trend that we're now seeing, not just in the military, but in, in the police, that far more men and women on our front lines in the civilian and military paradigms are ending their life by suicide in that battle-related instance than they are in the weapons that they have to confront in a, a different sort of setting. Are there any suggestions <laughs> you would have for someone going through a similar situation that you've experienced? There is, and I think beyond the whole self-care aspect, um, and it really is, you know, the monster is not satisfied, Chris, with just taking us apart piece by piece in our mind. The monster wants, wants to devour our body, our mind, and our spirit. And so we have to have the same sort of approach to be truly well. And so for me, it's about diet and sleep and exercise and time outside. It's about counseling. It's about psychiatry. It's about medication. And it's about peer support. And here's when I talk to ROTC cadets, I'm like, look, there's a great definition of hope that says hearing other people's experiences. If you create within your squads and your platoons and your battalions this opportunity to share in a safe place, get rid of this idea that if you ask for help, you're weak, you will provide this thing. In the words of my brother, you will provide this thing called hope. But here's, here's a unique idea that, again, my friend Greg, who talked to me about this amnesia aspect of depression, that when he shared it, I thought it was so brilliant, I had to do it myself. And what it says is, he said, you know, I had this idea. And I'm like, okay, lay it on me. That, he said, the other day, I was feeling really good. I'm like, okay. And you know what I did? I'm like, I don't know what you did. He said, I called the suicide hotline. I'm like, what? What, you told me you were good. He said, yeah, but here's why I wanted to do that, is if I wanted to do it, so if I ever got in the place where I was actively suicidal and on that literal edge, when I dialed the number that time, it wouldn't be the first time. And so it would be easier. I would know what to expect. I would know what it was going to be like if I had to be put on hold. I would know what it was like when the person talked to me. And I'm like, well, how did that work? I mean, weren't they concerned when you called? I said, no, this is what I did. When the person got online, I said, hey, I just want to let you know I'm doing fine. But I wanted to practice this. So when I needed to do it, I would be able to do it. And I thought, you know what? That is about one of the most brilliant ideas that I have ever heard about. So I did it not long ago. And I'm like, so if I ever get into that point, it'll be so much easier 
to call that number the second time because I've done it the first time. So for the military audience is to say, look, call the hotlines when you're feeling good. Volunteer to sit with your brother or sister who's going through a time. Say, you know what? We're feeling good. Let's just go ahead and make a call. So I think that that's one of the things as an aspect of self-care, but it's also an example, Chris, of something that we can do to help somebody in need. First therapy sessions that I had when I got out of the psych hospital, my dear friend Larry went with me. And at the end of the first one on the way home, he said, hey, I got to make a quick stop. And I'm like, okay. So we pulled up Chris to this liquor store, grocery store kind of place. And he said, I'll be right back. And he comes out, goes in, comes back out and he's holding two pints, not beer, Ben and Jerry's. <laughs> I realized that there are a few things in this world that cannot be healed with the combination of brotherhood and ice cream. Amen. Amen yeah. to that. Yeah. <laughs> So a few minutes ago, you were talking about connection. You tell the most beautiful story about two horses, Odie and Prince, at the animal sanctuary that you used to lead. I can't think of anything that underscores the power of connection more than that story. Would you share it with our audience, please? I sure will. So <clears throat> when Odie came to the sanctuary, he was a 35-year-old, what they call Chris, a Tennessee walker, which is a gated horse. So they have this real fluid moment. So Odie had been this parade pony. But when he came to the sanctuary, he, he was a mess. He was depressed and emaciated and forlorn. And Chris, he had this bad right-hand hip, which caused him to list to the right-hand side. But when he came to the sanctuary, just like all the other animals, he made this transformation. He made his own journey from hellness to wellness. And Odie figured because of this parade pony background that he had, that he should be the town crier. So twice a day, morning and the evening, he'd be the first one at the gate. And then he would lead his posse from the front pasture to the rear where they would spend the day and they reverse course and go from the rear pasture back to the front and spend the night. Well, this one day I'm doing my chores and then have that funny feeling that we've all had, like, okay, something, something's not right. And I spin around and to my horror, Odie is down on his bad right hand hip, right on the edge of this big pond that we had in the back pasture. And then Chris, to my added horror, I watch as he tries to stand up, he can't, and he falls into the pond. And I think, dear God, he's, he's weak, he's, he's, he's old, he's never gonna be able to, to tread water. And so I rush up right to the edge of the pond. And then I think, well, wait a second, water's buoyant, he'll be okay. But over the next three hours, I watch as my magnificent horse had attempted to stand and fell back and attempted to stand and fell back and attempted to stand and fall back and realized that he was suffering. And I had to move forward at that time and make the most difficult decision of all and help him transition to the great pasture in the sky. And so go inside, call our vet, and we come up with this idea that this way we're gonna euthanize Odie in the pond and then pull his body out later. Well, the time I came back, it was the evening and all the animals were lined up, but it wasn't Odie in the primary position. He's in the water, struggling to keep his head above water. It's Prince, his best friend in all the world, this beautiful 30-something caramel color former racing horse. I mean, he and Odie were inseparable. And here's Prince standing in the lead position to honor his brother who is suffering. But Prince had never been in this position. And so he was hesitant and he was nervous. And when I opened the gate, he began to lead the other animals to the front pasture. But after five steps, he stopped. And when he let the other animals go by, he turned around, walked back up to the front pasture, planted his feet, looked down, and made this incredible, profound connection with Odie. And the three of us were there, like frozen in this triangular embrace, engaged in this goodbye, or at least I thought. Because five minutes later, Odie stood up and he steadied himself. And then he took a slow turn and made his way out the shallow end of the pond. And he walked up to me, Chris, and put his head right in the center of my chest and moved it back and forth. And then he broke apart and went nose to nose with Prince. And what Prince knew, in the words of the late Randy Pausch, is an injured lion still wants to roar. And then the two besties made their way back to the front pasture. Now, I'll end with the fact that Odie didn't live for three more months after that amazing day. Odie didn't live for three more weeks. Odie didn't live for three more days. Odie lived for three more years. That's connection. 
Connection creates hope. Hope saves lives. Thank you for that incredible story. And David, we're way off script and we have to have you back in the show, but with about 30 seconds left, how can folks find you? Please uh, feel free to give me a phone call, 916-247-6389 or david at davidwoods, W-O-O-D-S, Bartley.com. David Woods Bartley, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you, Chris. I'm Chris Meek. This is Next Steps Forward. We're out of time, but we'll be back next, next week, same place, same time. Till then, keep taking your next steps forward.